why are unaccompanied minors coming now? Right? Because it's like, I understand when they come with their families, uh, the parents are trying to create a new life. I get that. Why are the unaccompanied minors coming right now in particular numbers? Very specific reason is actually one very singular cause. And it's at the heart of a lawsuit that we are filing right now with the state of Texas through America First Legal. Last year, when the pandemic hit, President Trump instituted a public health authority that is known as Title 42. So anytime you hear the words or see the words Title 42, that's what it's referring to. It's a public health statute that says that the Department of Health and Human Services, the statute says the Surgeon General, but by regulation, it's um, it's devolved to the director of the CDC. That the Department of Health and Human Services through the CDC can suspend the entry of goods or people if it threatens public health with a communicable disease. So we we triggered that statute when the pandemic hit mm-hmm. in order to stop illegal immigration. Because the process for legal immigration usually involves extensive cohabitation, extensive contact with border agents and law enforcement personnel, lengthy time in custody, and many other events that lead to super spreaders, that lead to significant public health harms. And so we instituted Title 42 across the board, all demographics, all ages. And so in the case of unaccompanied minors who are disproportionately teenagers, what that meant was that just like every other country in the world, we would call their local government, we would contact their embassies, we'd contact their consulates, we'd arrange for a flight of minors, hand them off to their health and human services and their diplomatic and our diplomatic personnel, and then reunite them with their families or guardians in their home countries, which is the humane thing to do. Uh, within only a few weeks of doing that, the number of unaccompanied minors coming into our country hit record lows for modern times. I say modern Mm -hmm. times because this is a more modern phenomenon. It hit record lows, like nothing the Border Patrol had ever seen before. And that persisted until the there was some litigation over it. But I'll fast forward through that. Biden comes in. The D.C. Circuit Court has fully upheld the authority to apply Title 42 across the board. And Biden decides to exempt categorically anyone traveling alone at the age of 17 or younger from Title 42, instead wow. opting for a 100% resettlement policy. And oh, so wow. that happened only a few weeks into the administration. And so they, they, for they said for this one specific demographic, there's a guarantee of resettlement in the United States. Within a matter of weeks, they hit record highs and have continued to set all-time records. Again, the last five months, the number of unaccompanied minors arriving has exceeded every pre-Biden month in history. So no precedent for what's happening now. So our lawsuit, in which we are outside counsel for Texas, is seeking an injunction to say that as long as the pandemic conditions require Title 42, you are obligated to apply it evenly and universally, and you cannot make non-medical, non-scientific, politically-based exceptions. Right. And if you think about it now, look what's happening in our schools with teenagers. You know, they're they're being mandated, American citizens who are in school right now, mandated to take the vaccine, mandated to wear masks, mandated to have three to six feet between them and their classmates, and not to mention the plexiglass. And, you know, you can't play certain sports and you can't sing during recess and you can't. So that's what American citizens who are teenagers are going through right now. But if you are an illegal immigrant coming into the country across the southern border and you're 16 or 17 and you've got COVID, no problem. Come right in. Come right in. And no, by and the fact, way, you're, they, and you're probably going to probably going to infect the other illegal migrants who are there and get them sick. And some of them will be hospitalized. Some of them will get gravely ill. And you're also going to infect other people living in the United States. And this is a very important point that should be obvious, but it escapes people. A lot of people will say to me, they'll say, well, Stephen, why don't you just say, we'll let in all the illegal immigrants, but we'll test them all first, right? So we'll let them all in and we'll test them all. No, they're not even testing them. So let's be clear. Uh, in most cases, they're not even testing illegal immigrants. But they are uh, testing just some. I just, I just heard that they have some 20,000 in custody down at the border who, who have COVID. Yeah, no, they're, they're absolutely testing some. 
the um, okay. but they're not testing all of them because you have to understand that they're 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 over seven sometimes eight thousand new immigrants showing up per day. So the numbers mm-hmm. are so overwhelming, so beyond their capacity that That's many right. aren't being tested and just being released. But but here's but here's the important point because illegal immigration is dynamic. That's what I always when I try to teach people about it, I always try to say it's dynamic, it's not static. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So people would say, well, why do you need Title 42? Why do you need to why do you need to just return people who come during a pandemic? Why not just test everybody? And if they test positive, quarantine them in the border for 14 days. And if they test negative, release them into the country. Now, aside from the fact that that would be illegal, um, here's why that would be a public health disaster. If you announced to the world that you were going to get free medical care if you're positive and you get automatic release if you're negative, well, what happened is some version of what we're seeing today, which is that you would see numbers arriving, many of whom are already sick, many of whom are already infected, beyond your wildest nightmares. The numbers that would arrive would increase so exponentially that the number of people infected arriving in our country would collapse the whole system. And that's a version of what we've had right now. They wouldn't just infect each other. They wouldn't just infect border agents. They would infect everyone they come into contact with. And then here's the other thing. Everyone who tests negative is one, two, three days away from a positive test. In other words, if you have a group Mm. of 50 illegal immigrants that have been traveling together for three weeks, they show up at the border and 10 of them test positive, and then you release the other 40. Newsflash, the other 40 are within five days of their positive test. And during those five Mm -hmm. days, they're going to infect 400 Americans. The... When you had Title 42 in place uniformly, the numbers that came were so small, so controlled, so manageable that we did not have a single super spreader event along our southwest border for the entirety of the Trump administration. Think about that. In the worst days of the pandemic, Mm -hmm. we don't have a single super spreader event at the border under President Trump because Title 42 worked. And that's why we're suing, just like the MPP lawsuit. From Texas. That's why we're assuming to say you trick, con- contrived, capricious, and fake reasons alter life and death public health guidance to suit your political agenda. And just to just to talk about some of the numbers, uh, in July alone, it was the highest monthly number of migrants detained in over 21 years, unaccompanied children, over 18,000 of them, a 24% increase just from the month before, just from June. And so far this year, there's been over 1.5 million enforcement actions already higher than the full year, any full year since 2005, just to, just to figure, you know, just to put some meat on the bones of how bad this is getting. Um, And for a while there, the media was covering it and then they seemed to get tired of covering it. Yeah, they've, Um, yeah, they've moved on. And, and the, and the reality is, is that it's getting worse by the day and the consequences are irreparable. But, but just on the numbers real quick, one of the things I always yeah. say to people is that it's worse than even the numbers would suggest. Because when you hear that it's the, um, the highest total in over two decades, basically going back to the, to the turn of the century, around the year 2000, illegal immigration was about 95% single adult males from Mexico. And so basically what that meant was that People cross the border, Border Patrol apprehends them, they put them in a van, and they drive them back to the port of entry, and Mexico takes them back, and that's pretty much the end of the story. Now, a lot of them get into the country because they, get, they evade detection entirely, but the concept of catch and release didn't even exist in the year 2000. I won't go through the whole history of how we ended up with catch and release, but suffice it to say, it didn't exist in the year 2000. Now we have illegal immigration from 160 countries, so you can't just put someone in a van and drive them back across the border. That you have to manifest flights to, to India, to Nambia, to Brazil, to uh, Russia, and so on. You have to manifest flights all over the world. So when you have numbers like this, it completely crashes the system. And the, um, and the other thing is that you have entire demographics that are released categorically, um, unaccompanied alien minors. And the vast, vast, vast majority of family units are just released automatically into the country. Again, something that never happened, never existed in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about unaccompanied minors, because that was a big controversy when you were in the White House with Trump. Um, He initiated a zero tolerance policy. 
That meant any adult caught crossing the border was going to be prosecuted. Um, and the children couldn't be jailed with their family members. And so the families were separated. And they say, we just checked with Department of Homeland Security, over 1,800 children have not yet been reunified with their parents. That was a huge story. It was, you know, this is where we saw the kids in the cages. And we found out that the cages had been in existence under Barack Obama. But there's no question that the policy was tighter under President Trump by design than under Barack Obama, who was only separating children from their families, from their parents, if the parents were suspected criminals, uh, suspected of hurting the children and so on. Okay, so we had a different policy under Trump. And that is something that bothered a lot of Americans, even even a lot of uh, Republicans didn't like seeing the children separated from the parents. And even Trump, even Trump came out and said, I did not like seeing those kids separated from the parents. So what do you make now in retrospect, knowing that those 1800 kids are still separated from the parents of that policy? Well, I, I certainly, first of all, I don't I don't think that any of the numbers that the ACLU has put out in litigation about any aspect of this is even remotely accurate. And so I would take this all of that with DHS. a grain of salt. We, we got our number from DHS. They said they put it at 1841, still separated. The Well, the current DHS is relying on the claims from the ACLU that is filed in the lawsuit. Um, okay. DHS under President Trump uh, was quite clear in saying that um, – that those numbers were deeply inaccurate and that as best they could tell, um, mostly involved cases of people who waived reunification. In other words, for the same reason that people sent mm -hmm. unaccompanied yeah. aliens to the country, you have cases in immigration every single day. I mean, take, for example, ICE goes to a house and there is, which again doesn't happen anymore, but ICE goes to a house to carry out an enforcement action for a wanted fugitive. And they've been living in the country for seven years, and they have two children who are born here, and therefore, because of birthright citizenship, are decreed to be U.S. citizens. The, the parent in that case, since the beginning of INS, has always had the choice to take their children home or to leave them with a caregiver in the United States. And so one of the things that people don't understand about this, and the ACLU purposely obfuscates, is that according to DHS, in every instance in which there was an enforcement action with illegal families, um, they were all asked if they wished to leave their children in the United States or if they wish to take them to their home country. And so much of what the Biden administration is doing right now is not, not, they're not trying to reunite people in their home country. They're going back to the people who waived taking their children home with them and saying, would you like to come back to America and you can all live illegally together in the United States? Um, so I just say that's that really, by, by way that's of verification. That, so reunification yeah. under Biden is to get the parents who we've already sent back home to the their States. countries of origin to come back here and live Correct. permanently with their children. Right.